How is the church instructed to use music? What music does God not listen to? And does music exist in heaven? Stay tuned for the completion of this two-part series on A God of Music on this week's episode of Monday Morning Scripture Study. Right. Welcome back. I am back after a couple weeks hiatus. I'm really sorry about that, but it was a much needed break for me. But now that I'm back at it, I hope you're ready for ex- an exciting conclusion to this series on to, uh, to this series on a god of music. Now make sure to subscribe to my channel and click the notification bell so that you don't miss out on more scripture studies just like this one. If you like this video, make sure that you turn that thumbs up icon blue down below and comment. Comment your favorite worship song. We did this last uh, last installment, but uh, yeah, go ahead and comment your favorite worship song down below. And while you're commenting, you can always throw up a passage or a topic that you want me to cover next week or next time or sometime in the future on Monday morning Bible study. Once again, thank you, Dietrich, for the great suggestion on this topic. He's a subscriber, and he um, he gave me some gave me some input, gave me a suggestion, and that's what that's why I'm doing this series. So, just like last installment, I won't be reading from one location today, but I'll be bouncing around. So, feel free to pause the video, flip through your Bible as necessary, and um, or I'll just be putting the the passages up on the screen so you can look at that. But yeah, if you need to pause and read through everything, um, sometimes I know I don't put the verse up long enough, perhaps. Now, in the last video, we did an overview of music in the Bible and its different uses, not just spiritually, but culturally, you know, when it came up in the Bible, what was going on. And we focused on King David and the Psalms, and we actually saw a spot uh, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, where Jesus actually sang. So that was really cool to look at. And we went over the general spiritual principles of why we make music, you know, to worship God, to, to make him known, etc. So if you haven't watched that video, go ahead and click on the card in the top of the screen. I'm not sure which side, but um, go watch that video and you'll get all that background info of, of part one of this series. This week, I'm going to be covering the New Testament instruction on music in the church and we're going to talk about the so-called worship music that God actually does not care for. And we'll finish with what music is going to be like in heaven. Is, mu- is there going to be music in heaven? And stick around until the end. I promise you, you will be blown away by the last passage I'm going to cover. It, it left me shook. So I hope, you know, I think it's going to leave you shook as well. So stay tuned, stay to the end. It's, it's a really great topic. And there is a passage that I... At one point, when I found this verse, it just made me think about God in a a totally new way. Not not in a new way, but it made me realize something new about God that I never knew before. It's just amazing. So without further ado, let's get into the New Testament instructions on music in the church, in in the Christian church and the New Testament church. We actually see maybe the two most common passages that line up really well together. They almost say the same exact thing. There's a couple wording differences, but they're both written by Paul. One is to the church in Colossae. One is to the church in Ephesus. They line up very similarly, um, and they both contain musical instruction for the church. And uh, they the re- really uh, fulfill, these passages really fulfill kind of the new covenant form of what David instituted in the temple worship. When David built the tabernacle, the temple, you know, and he was setting it up for Solomon to take over and build the, the real full temple, David and, and the chiefs, you know, in verse, uh, I'm sorry, in first Chronicles chapter 25, we, we touched on this briefly last time, uh, last video, but David and, and his people in charge, the priests set aside some of the priests to quote, prophesy with lyres and harps and symbols. And he delegated these duties. They were very specific duties to the priests. It was a very serious job, a spiritual job, but, but, um, you know, prophesying really just means talking, you know, saying what God says, you know, repeating God's words really. So, a couple different ways to take that verse, but basically they were singing and they were making music, not just singing, but they were playing instruments and David had it all delegated out very orderly. And, 
and the purpose was to worship God almost continually, but definitely on a daily basis. Whenever the crowd got, whenever the people of Israel gathered, um, they needed people that were skilled in the musical instruments, and that, that was an important part of worship to David. Uh, we can worship God with music, and we will. And it was delegated. It wasn't just a flippant thing, you know. You know, music wishy washy. You know, whenever, <laughs> you know, just find a random guitar. No. It was, it was instituted, it was uh, very concrete and instructional. But Colossians and Ephesians, actually the passages are Colossians ver- chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, and Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, and 20, uh, 18 through 21. Uh, I might be able to put them both on the screen at the same time, or might just uh, alternate. But in Colossians, the passage goes like this. It's a more broad passage, but it includes music in the middle of it. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving or thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That's Colossians chapter 3. In Ephesians, we hear, uh, starting in verse 18, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So in those two passages, right in the middle, we hear singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and in Ephesians, we say what we uh, we see are we here singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Both of them tailed uh, tailed off with giving thanks, you know, or doing it in thanksgiving. This well, with thanksgiving in your heart. Um, and by the way, the way the two passages start out is very interesting because Paul is basically saying the same words here. He's saying a slightly different way of saying each each one, but they, they line up extremely close. And the first one in Colossians starts with, let the word of Christ dwell richly in you, or dwell in you richly. And the other one starts out with, but be filled with the Spirit. So I tend to equate those two. What does being filled with the Spirit mean? It, uh, it means the word of Christ really directing you or dwelling in you richly is the way. I mean, that's a very harsh, uh, when I say harsh, I mean a very explicit um, adjective, the, the word dwell in you richly there. So anyway, uh, that's just a side note that those, you know, it's, it's really uh, interesting to line those two up. But what we see in both passages is like a reinstitution of this, that no, worshiping God through music was not just something for the Old Testament. We can worship God in the New Testament church, in the church stemming from Jesus. And music, it's, it's, it's like a, a reinstitution of worshiping with music and um, singing and being glad and making song, just like David did, except without all the harsh rules and regulations. Paul's not saying, you know, we're delegating this person and this person in the church. Um, but, you know, obviously that's what we do today. You know, certain people are musically, musically talented and they lead worship. But but really, we come together as a congregation, we sing, because that's what Paul says. And it's a lot less strict, it's a lot less uh, um, coordinated as an instruction, I guess I should say, in the New Testament, but that's what Paul says. And also, you know, we see from Paul as well in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, bringing up about, you know, you know, he's really correcting the Corinthian church about a lot of the things that they do in their worship services. When they gather together as a body, as a church, um, and they and they do their normal worship service, he corrects a lot of the things they do, speaking in tongues, being orderly. This is in that same passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. And then it skipped to verse 40, but all things should be done decently and in order. So here again, we see where it was common practice as early as the Corinthian church that Paul corrects in his letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, uh, that people were singing hymns and along with giving lessons or teaching, you know, which we commonly experience, and then revelations like sort of prophesying things from God or, or tongue, using tongues or interpreting the tongues. Uh, which we see less of, maybe depending on what church you go to. But, um, 
but certainly what they saw, what they had in that church, in that Corinthian church, was people singing hymns. But Paul really instructs them, instructs them, you know, we're not going to just be, you know, random and people singing randomly and making weird noises. Everything needs to be orderly. So if one person has a hymn, let it be done for building up, not for his own edification or for his own, uh, for his own puffing up, but for building everyone else up. If we're going to sing, let it be to encourage one another as we see in, um, as we see in Ephesians and Colossians. I mean, I think, uh, I think in Colossians, it says teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing, da, 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 da. Right. So, um, and, and then in Ephesians, addressing one another in psalms and spiritual songs and hymns singing and making melodies to the lord uh, to the lords uh, to the lord with your hearts so addressing one another um admonishing one another and then in first corinthians building one another up with hymns with song um in an orderly way though paul gives that clarification as he had to do with the corinthian church in general but we see you know we see clearly in the early church and as Paul instructs, the church is to make song with each other. All believers together should sing on a regular basis. And that's one of the things we should do as a church is we should make song, whatever it is. I mean, he doesn't necessarily say you should just sing. I mean, he says um, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs in Colossians. But, you know, in Ephesians, he says addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing. So hymns, songs. Does it need to be just words? Well, the emphasis is certainly on words because we need to be uh, admonishing one another. So just musical uh, musical instrumentation is not necessarily what Paul really gets at in the New Testament instruction. So we shouldn't just have, like David did, just people clashing cymbals to praise God because we have a greater understanding of the gospel and we have a deeper understanding of God's entire revelation. We can actually sing admonishing hymns and that's the idea, I think, that Paul really sets in all three of these passages. So we should gather as, as believers together and sing. But sing, you know, it, it derives a little bit from the Old Testament where let everything that has breath praise the Lord. We learned that, you know, we touched on that in the last video. And so from these passages, these three passages in the New Testament, um, Colossians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 5, and 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I got these, I think they're eight, yeah, eight characteristics of music in the church uh, and how, you know, what our music should be like and what our music should be about. And the first thing and the most important is the word of Christ. We see this um, right from the get-go in Colossians chapter 3. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing and singing. So, our song should be focused on the word and should be focused on Jesus Christ. And what is the word of Christ? Yes, scripture. It's really about the gospel of Jesus. And as we read in, in, uh, in John chapter 1, the word became flesh. Jesus is the fulfillment of all that scripture um, that God tells and reveals to us. So singing about Jesus, really singing about Jesus and what he's done, singing scriptural truth. That's point A. That's the first characteristic of music in the church. B, teaching. We got that from Colossians as well, teaching and admonishing one another. Teaching is just, just what it is, expressing truth uh, for believers, to believers, and to outsiders as well. Because teaching, I mean, we saw this from last week. We make the truths of God known to the outside world through music too. That was part of the Old Testament. Uh, that, that was part of Psalms. You know, let it be known. Let the whole world know what God's done through what we sing. And so teaching is step is a characteristic number two. So we should be focused on the word of Christ, scriptural truth, teaching, expressing truth to believers and, and to the outside world for that matter. And three, admonishing. Um, admonishing, warning, warning. Uh, Ad instructing. So admonishment is like a warning to fellow believers, mostly, you know, admo the term admonish really, Paul's really focusing on within the church, okay? We're, we're not admonishing the outsiders because we don't really have any common ground as far as objective basis to kind of admonish them with. We can, we can tell them and we can teach and we can, I guess, admonish in a way, but really, we should be admonishing one another and admonishing is just like instruction, but it's more of like a warning instruction. Like, Hey, 
this is what you should be doing, not that. And so, and if you do that, you're going to get into some trouble. So it's kind of like a dad sitting down with his son, teaching him like a hard lesson. You know what I mean? That's like admonishment. And so that's the third principle of our, our, of our music, the characteristic. Fourth one, thank, thankfulness, thanksgiving. Songs of thanksgiving, heartfelt, sincere. This is the beginning of worship, really. How can we sing about the greatness of God if we haven't experienced it? And how can we sing about it um, if, we, if we aren't thankful for it? How can we be joyful about it if we aren't thankful for it? So we read in Psalms, make a joyful noise, be joyful, right? But here in Colossians and in Ephesians, we read about being thankful and we sing with thanksgiving. When we sing, there's such a passion and emotion in church service worship a lot of times because we are expressing so much gratitude towards God for what he's done for us. There is thanksgiving in our worship, in our musical worship. Uh, that's the fourth characteristic. The fifth characteristic we see in these passages is in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, which kind of ties to the word of Christ, but that's more scriptural truth and uh, revelation of, of God's word. But in the name of Jesus, like I said, is focused on Jesus, but not just focused on him, but really what he did. Uh, we get this in... Um, we get this in Ephesians 5, giving thanks always and for everything to, the, to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we see as well in Colossians chapter 3, whatever you do, and that encapsulates everything we just went over, singing, spiritual songs, thanksgiving, teaching, admonishing, wisdom, giving thanks, whatever you do in word or deed, everything, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks, right? So we already went over that in the name of Jesus, meaning focusing on Jesus and what he did and doing it for his glory. So our music is for his glory. It's not for us to, to do a concert to everyone so that we can look good and show off our musical talents. That's not why we worship. We do it in the name of Jesus for his glory and telling about him and what he did. That's the fifth principle. The, the, the next uh, characteristic is spiritual. Spiritual. Our music should be spiritual. What does that mean? Is that like some, you know, some vibe, you know, some, some uh, wishy-washy, you know, emotion? Not necessarily. It's, you know, as we read in, in Ephesians, don't get drunk with wine. Don't be controlled by wine. That's debauchery. But be controlled by the Spirit. Be filled by the Spirit. Like a sail, you know, John MacArthur talks about this, like a sailboat, you know, this, this word filled with really, it, it it's used um, for directional purposes. So when a sailboat, when its sail is filled up with wind, it's pushing the boat in that direction. That's the same terminology in the Greek that's used in this passage. So to be filled with the Spirit is to be basically directed by the Spirit, as if you have a spiritual sail, and instead of filling, you know, pushing your own wind and your own glory and your own devices to direct your ways, let the Spirit fill your spiritual sail uh, and carry you in the direction what you're supposed to do and what where you're supposed to go. So spiritual is really focused on and driven by those things that the spirit does. So the fruits of the spirit, convicting. What I mean, what does the spirit do in New Test? Uh, what does the Holy Spirit do in the New Testament? It dwells in us, yes. Uh, it 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 directs us. What are the other things that we know? The fruits of the spirit. It it creates these uh, these attributes in us. So that's what our mo our music should focus on. Uh, peace, patience, kindness, right? Uh, gentleness. All these things is what our music should focus on. Um, being filled with the Spirit means uh, when we when we sing uh, our psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, it's in the same it's in the same step of what the Spirit would do. Convicts us of sin, so our music should convict us of our sin. Teaching us truth. That's what the Spirit does. You don't need a teacher because the Spirit is your teacher. Helping, guiding, all these principles of what the Spirit does, the music should reinforce all those things. So, so spiritual music is not emotional music. That's not what the Spirit is. The Spirit is not emotion. The Spirit is, is, a, is a force that really directs and kind of controls our life. And so to sing spiritually um, and spiritual songs in Colossians hymns and spiritual songs in Ephesians chapter five, hymns and spiritual songs um, is focused on all those things that the spirit does. 
And the next, the the sixth, or the I'm sorry, the seventh characteristic of the music in the church is orderly. We get that from 1 Corinthians chapter 14. The music in our church should not be crazy and wild and out of control. Everyone in the room, when the music is playing, when everyone's singing together, everyone should know what's being said, what what lyrics are being said, you know, what's the procedure, what are we doing right now? It should not be ad hoc. Music should not just be playing, you know, just underneath the sermon the whole time to kind of like do this weird hypnosis thing where it drives people. I mean, that is not orderly. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, but all things should be done decently and in order. Okay? The hymns, the lessons, the revelations, the tongues. All in order, including the hymns. So when we sing those songs, it's not just random. It's not just wild. It's not out of control. Um, The music shouldn't just be blasting so loud that no one knows what's being sung. I mean, that's not orderly and it's not helpful and it's not teaching and admonishing. So that's kind of my like little critique. I'm not a super old man, you know, like obviously you can play instruments and you can do all your thing. But, but the point we get is if the, if the worship music is more about the music and not about the words, then that kind of breaks down all these principles that we're talking about, all these characteristics, but orderly is a big thing. You know, you know, it needs to be in the right place in the service. Someone needs to be in, in, in charge, like leading. So that's why we, we have worship leaders and we have lyrics on the screen and all that is to help us keep order. You know, we all stand up and then we all sit down. Um, that's to help maintain order so that things aren't just wildly randomly happening. And the last principle, the last characteristic of uh, music in the church is edifying, edifying, uh, building one another up. So um, making, making melody to the Lord with your, uh, with your heart, submitting to one another out of reverence, but let me see, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. That is edifying. And so encouraging for the purpose of making others into the image of Christ. Oh, this is also from 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Let all things be done for building up. That's the word for building up is edifying. So this is the, for the purpose of making others more into the image of Christ. That is what edifying is. So it's not for puffing up, as Paul says. It's not for, for people who are skilled at music or have good voices or know how to, know how to lead worship really well to showcase their talents. Uh, it's, not, it's not even to bring people into the church. We don't really see that in any of these passages. You know, we, we, it's not like a seeker-friendly thing, like we play really cool music so that people come in and then they hear... That's not the point. That's not the point of what's brought up. That might be a side effect if you're if you are good at music and you make good music and it's it's tasteful to the outside world. Who knows? I mean, you can do all these these things and then as a side effect people are brought in, but that's not the point that we get. We don't see that as a purpose in any of these passages. We do see it in the Old Testament as far as teaching and and singing so that the whole world knows. But all that to say uh, on this last point there should be zero pride in musical worship in the church because it's all about building others up. Let all things be done for building up and, um, and, and constructing and edifying the church up towards Christ. So that is a very in-depth look at the main New Testament passages instructing the church on singing and, and music. And I, I just love that, you know, music was not lost in the old Testament. You know, David is probably looking down at us and listening to all the music we're making today and very happy, I think. And, you know, he loved music. He instituted it in the temple. We're still doing it today in a new covenant, not in a temple, but in the gathering of believers, which is now the new temple, the the presence of, um, the presence of the Lord. And we can do it whenever. I mean, we can, we can sing songs by ourselves. But um, that doesn't fulfill all the points of what we just talked about. But, but I just love this instruction. We're not leaving music behind. This was not just an Old Testament thing. This is God. God is a God of music. If, music, if God didn't care about music, if music was just uh, some, some part of this world that you know, didn't exist outside and, and God wasn't really interested in, he wouldn't reinstitute it in the New Testament. This might have just been something that he had in the Old Testament because David cared about it. But no, it, it shows itself throughout the entire Bible, and it's instituted by God through Paul's writings, through Paul's instruction to us, even to this day. We, wor- we make music to do all those things I just talked about, to worship God, essentially. 
So what is music that doesn't matter? What is music that God really is not into and God really doesn't care about and he even despises? Well, I've been using that terminology. You might be wondering, what are you talking about? Like rock music or like sinful music or hip hop or whatever? <laughs> and no, that's not what I mean. Uh, the style of music really, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, I don't think God could care less about the style of music as long as it's it's good. I mean, if if it takes talent and there's there's some sort of artistry behind it, obviously God has inspired that partially. But And so it's not in, you know, besides the couple of caveats I said about order and, you know, not just making a ruckus in the church. But the whole point of music that doesn't matter is the heart behind the worshiper behind the singer, behind the music maker. And so to get into this, we have to go to Amos, the book of Amos, chapter 5, verse 21 through 24. And this is one of the saddest passages, because I love music, but it just strikes you right to the core of how God strikes down this, this false worship, basically. And that's really what it comes down to. And I think that we have a lot of this in our church today. People who sing music, for the heck of it, just to sing music. And it's just part of our worship service and people just love it because it's an emotionally pleasing thing to do. And it's just check off the checklist. God doesn't care. And this is why he doesn't care. Let me read that, that passage in Amos chapter five. I hate, this is God to the Israelites in the Old Testament. I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. God's like mocking them try to act solemn. No, you're not. Not sincerely. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, God says. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I won't even look at them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. Instead, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. God is shooting down this false worship that the Israelites had gotten themselves into. And at this point, you have to know that Israel has failed, God rescued them. Failed, God rescued them. Sinned, God rescued them. Start worshiping false idols, God rescued them. Uh, idols again, idols again, idols again, idols again. Again and again and again, Israel fails and God keeps giving them a second chance. And eventually here in Amos, he's telling them, look, I don't care about your, your offerings. I don't care about all these worship. You guys do all this stuff to worship me, but you don't have your heart in it. You don't even practice justice and righteousness in your daily lives. You just come to these assemblies so you can check off the box that you fulfilled the requirements of the law. I don't care about that. The requirements of the law were instituted to, to get you to focus on me in your heart. And so because of Israel's persistent sinful conduct, they were living sinfully day in, day out, and then they would come together and then practice all these, you know, basically going through the motions. Sacrifice the animal, sing the song, burn the offering, go back to sin. Because of Israel's persistent sinful lifestyle and conduct, and because of their prefer perversion of, uh, of worship at Bethel, now that was a, that was a doozy. Chapter 4, verse uh, 4 and 5 of Amos tells you what was going on there. It was like they were mocking, they were doing mocking imitations of Jerusalem worship, the worship that God instituted, but they were doing them to, like, at Bethel to another, to false idols. And it was basically like an imitation, like a mockery of God's worship, the, the worship that God instituted for them. So it was despicable. And so God says, I'm not going to listen to your worship to me the same way you mock me and worship those idols. And then we, we see a little bit of this in Proverbs chapter 7, verse 14, and you get the seductress. Remember, th this is wisdom or Solomon or whoever wrote this, speaking to the young man and saying, hey, watch out for that, watch out for that seductress, watch out for that, you know, loose lady in the streets. You know, it's very tempting to go enjoy a night with her, the prostitute or whatever. But in this case, she's not really a prostitute. She's married to a man who's gone away on a business trip and she's, she wants the young man. And what does the woman say at the beginning when she's talking to, when, when the man walks by her corner, right? And she's at her fence and he leans in, they, they start talking. She says, I had to offer sacrifices today and I paid my vows. So now I can come out to meet you and seek you eagerly. 
basically what that means is I just checked off my sin eradication machine. I just went to the temple and offered sacrifices today, so all my sins got cleared, so I'm fresh and ready to pile more sin onto my balance sheet. And that is, that is just sad. It was a sad way. And this wasn't just her. This is the way we read in Amos that the whole nation of Israel had become. Worship was not about worship anymore. It was just about fulfilling the checklist to please God so that his wrath didn't bear down on their sin. But you know what? Doing the motions is not what God is after. He's after the heart and he's after true justice and righteousness. That's what we read there. Israel had a true lack of justice. I mean, people taking bribes, people, you know, not looking out for the poor, people just constantly sinning. And then they would come on what we would say Sunday, or they would come on Sabbath and do their thing, or they would come to the festival and do their peace offering or their whatever. God hated and despised Israel's empty, meaningless worship. Because it didn't mean anything. If it's a checklist, it doesn't mean anything. There's no, there's no actual sincere heart in the matter. You're not actually worshiping God. You're just pretending. So your songs know this. When you go to church on Sunday, you stand up because everyone else is standing up, and you sing because the music is cool, or you sing because the music is catchy. Your songs don't mean anything to God if you don't mean what you're singing. If you are not expressing the emotion that you try to put a face on and try to portray. And God doesn't care about your music, musical worship, if you're hypocritical between what you sing and then how you live. You're singing all these great things about Jesus, how he's changed your life, how, how you, you don't, you know, how you walk in a new life because of him, or I don't know what the worship songs are today, or, you know, how, how much you're thankful for him. And then you go in the rest, the whole rest of your week, you just sin constantly. You just totally forget about God in your, in your week. And then you come to church on Sunday and dare to sing so, something so hypocritical, God doesn't care. It's like you didn't even sing that to God because he's already, he's tuned you out. Your song went up to God and just went zoop right around him because he wasn't paying attention. That's what he said in Amos. He said, I won't listen to it. I won't look upon it. Take away from me your songs. The melody of your harps, I will not listen. So if, and also if you hinder justice and despise righteousness. So if you, if you have an attitude towards justice, if you're out there oppressing people in your life, if you're not looking out for the poor, looking out for the needy, sacrificing some of your time to help people out, if you're not upholding justice, if you're doing something shady in the background and you're ripping people off and you are against righteousness, you live your life against it, against what God says is right and wrong, you should be concerned. But, you know, one of the things you should be not doing is singing because that the music you sing in so-called worship is not real. And God knows it because he knows your heart. So it's not about just the action of singing. It's about expressing something that's inside of you. It's an expression. And if, if, you're, and if it's not inside of you, then it's a fake, it's a fake express. It's not real expression and God's not going to listen. So Isaiah 5 puts it this way. It says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. We just talked about that, despising righteousness. Woe to those who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes, prideful, and shrewd in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes at, I love this. Woe to those who are, who are uh, heroes at drinking wine, valiant men at mixing strong drink, basically professional drunkards, right? And woe to those who, are, who acquit the guilty, for a bribe. Who isn't that touching in this day and age and what we're going through right now? Some of the, some of the things that we've experienced <clears throat> now, I obviously bribe may not be part of it, but, but God really loves justice. He is perfectly just. And like, for instance, what we have going on right now with George Floyd and, you know, I won't bring up all the details, but look, if this police officer doesn't, I mean, if, if the evidence shows something and he doesn't get charged with something, then justice won't have been done. That's what, that's what the plea is about. God loves justice. Look, he's going to make all things right. Just as a background on the George Floyd thing, God is the only one who can make perfect justice. Even all our justice courts and systems here, it's not going to perfectly rectify what happened. Only God will do that 
by sending people to hell or by punishing Jesus on the cross. It's an interesting thing to think about. But listen, but, but let's keep through this passage. Those people who acquit the guilty for a, bribe, for a bribe and deprive the innocent of his right, they have lyre and harp later in the passage, tambourine and flute and wine of their feasts, but they do not re- regard the deeds of the Lord or see the work of his hands. So you could just, you could just see people who are at church and on Sunday, their, their, their hand is raised up to, you know, they're singing their songs, they're, they're jumping for joy or they're smiling, singing, but look at their life. Okay, that's all I'm saying. And that's the kind of music that God doesn't listen to, God doesn't care for, and that is not true worship. And that's kind of a tough pill to swallow, but reassess yourself. I do it all the time. Why am I singing like this? I'm up there on Sunday morning singing along. I'm like, I need to just sit down and pray because I don't, this is not coming from my heart. And if it isn't, just stop singing and just start praying and just start asking for forgiveness and confessing your sin to God, really. If, the, if you get nothing else, get that as like my instruction to you, something that I deal with and something that I try to do to help out. Now, what is music like outside of this world? Are we going to sing in heaven? Is there going to be music? And uh, is God really a God of music? Or is music just for this earth? Or is it eternal? Is God like, did God sing, you know, or did God may have music playing for him before he even created this universe? Now, needless to say, there will be a lot of music to worship God in heaven. You know, hopefully you've read a little bit of Revelation before, but I'll go over some of the highlights. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 through 14. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding what? A harp. (laughs) So there's musical instruments in heaven. Take it to the bank. And golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. They sang in heaven. John saw it. He documented it. And here we have it. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. They're talking about Jesus. For you were slain, your blood was, uh, by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Another great verse for this, for this, all this racial things we have going on in our society right now. You were slain by your blood. You ransomed people back to God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Wow, that's powerful. That's the song we're going to be singing. That's the song we're going to be singing in heaven. That's the music you're going to hear in heaven. Good morning. Then I looked around and heard the throne uh, and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads of thousands of thousands sang with a loud voice singing, basically. It says sang with a loud voice, but I'm implying because there was music in that previous section that it's continuing the same song worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them. Hyperbolic language, just everything to him who sits on the throne is the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. That's the song we're going to be hearing in heaven. That's what John, that's what John heard. Revelation chapter 14 said, I heard a voice from heaven, like the roar of many waters and the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was what? Like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. So we, we hear, you know, in Revelation, and we can apply a lot of different places in Revelation where the people are saying something or exclaiming something or saying with a loud voice. We can apply that that's music, but those are two instances where music is directly referenced. And, you know, another thing is, if you read Job 38, you know, Job complains to God, and he says, God, how could you do all this stuff, all this horrible stuff in my life? I listened to my friends. It was no good. And God sits there and says, how dare you question me, basically? God says, were you there? Were you there at the beginning of the world? And I'm going to flip over here, you know, because in reading this in context, you re- just go read all of Job chapter 38. Were you there when I laid the foundation of the earth? Verse four, tell me if you have understanding, if, if Job, if you can reason with me, I'm, I'm God. If you've got understanding to be able to even talk with me right now about this subject, who determined the measurements of the earth? Surely, you know, come on, you were just telling me about how horrible I am, right? About for doing all this stuff. Who stretched out the line upon which I placed the earth? 
Where was where were its uh, bases sunk? Who laid its cornerstone? The cornerstone of the earth, huh? Who laid it? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So we see right there in that passage, at the creation of the universe, at the creation of the world, the angels were singing in joy. The morning stars, the angels were singing together and the sons of God shouting for joy. Wow. So there is music in heaven. God is a God of music. Music existed before humans ever came along. Music existed at the very beginning of time, at the very beginning of our universe, because God is a God of music. Heaven will be filled with music. I can almost guarantee it. Heaven will be filled of people exclaiming and worshiping with music and song and singing of all the great things that Jesus has done and all the great things that God has done. It will be be amazing. I guarantee it. But there's one more thing. and I, I know this is running a little bit long, but stick with me. This is the thing that I warned you about in the beginning. There's one song that we cannot experience on this earth that I, I just don't think we can experience it. The music we hear in Revelation, the, the music I just talked about in heaven, might we might be, it might be comparable to the music we hear on earth, although I'm sure it'll be much better, but there's one song that is just out it's out of comprehension that we will hear one day if we believe in Jesus go to heaven one beautiful sound that one day we will experience that I personally cannot wait for it's written about by the minor prophet Zephaniah go to Zephaniah chapter 3 and look at verse 14 through 20 starts out with God saying, Sing aloud. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. For the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord Yahweh, is in your midst. Wow. Because the whole history of Israel was... God briefly showing up and being in their midst and, brief, and, then, and then when they rededicated the temple. Nehemiah, God's presence wasn't there. God's presence is very important. Listen to the wording. We, we take for granted the presence of God now through the Spirit, but to the people of Israel just desperately waiting for justice and waiting for the restoration of, of salvation of the people of Israel. The King of Israel the Lord your God is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. Jesus, Yeshua, God saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love, he will exult over you with loud singing. I can't wait for that. I'll, I'll, I'll just read to finish this passage off. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer a reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors and I will save the lame and I will gather the outcasts and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you in. I, at that time I'll gather you together for I will make you renowned and praised among the peoples of the earth and I will restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. But what in that passage? God says he'll sing over us who have been grafted into that Israel. Is promise to Israel. Us Gentiles, us believers, anyone who's found in Christ, anyone who's saved, who will be brought together into the new Jerusalem, will hear God sing over us. Exult over us. Rejoice over us with gladness. He'll be the one singing. Because song is about joy. It's about expression. When God brings us together, he'll be so joyful that we've been saved, that he's been able to reconcile some of us back to him. Through Jesus, one day, 
God will sing over us. <laughs> Isn't that just incredible? He'll exult over us with loud singing. When he makes all things right, he will also sing his own song. Imagine a song written by God. Imagine a song sung by God. Can you imagine God's singing voice? We know that Jesus sang when he was in human form, but can you imagine the God of the universe in heaven on his throne singing? I shake at the, I shake at the thought. So sing. People of God sing. For all the following reasons, we've talked about them. To worship God, to remember what God has done, to tell others about God, to encourage other believers, to soothe other people's souls. Music can just be used to soothe people. You know, David played his harp for King Saul. To celebrate what God has done, to express your thanksgiving to God, to teach God's word to each other. And lastly, well, last two, in anticipation of heaven. It's another reason we sing. But last of all, you sing in a weird way because God sings. You sing because you copy God. Music is part of God's nature. It's part of God's character. God loves music, so we love music. That's why we sing for all those reasons and patiently wait for the day that God will serenade you with his song and his goodness for all of eternity. That concludes this two-part series on a God of music. Once again, if you haven't listened to part one, go back and listen to its great background. And with that, I'll just say, Subscribe if you're not subscribed to stay tuned, you know, listen to all my material. I don't just do Bible podcast stuff, uh, but every Monday morning we'll do another scripture study. Click the like button if you enjoyed this. Guys, I put a lot of work, a lot of research into this, so please click the like button if you enjoyed it. Share it with somebody. Let's get our subscriber count up. We're at 55 right now. I don't know, but uh, you know I'm doing that giveaway on my last video, my business podcast I released a couple days ago. There's a poll I put for the comments section. Go back to that and answer that comment question about this uh, giveaway that I'm going to be doing. Once again, subscribe, click the like button, comment down below your favorite worship song. I'll catch you guys around on the next video. Until then, 